Hey friends, welcome back. This is episode nine of Generator, and I'm calling this one Flying Into a New Type of Fine Art. And my guest this week is Sarah Rocca. She's a fine art photographer, retoucher, and drone-assisted self-portrait artist. She and I have been in the same circles for several years now, but I've never really had the chance to sit down and get to know her. Well, Sarah's developed a relatively new style of self-portrait that mixes her love of darker thematic portraits with flying lawnmowers, a.k.a. drones. Her process creates these fascinating aerial views, and it's quickly become beloved by clients that want something uniquely different. So over the next hour and change, we talk about everything from her search to find her artistic voice, to struggles with mental health, to creating this new style of portraiture, to traveling the world, something that she does quite a bit. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this conversation with Sarah Rocca. Now on with the show. I'm really happy that we're doing this. Thanks for being here. Oh, thank you for having me. <laughs> How is now you're in New Hampshire and I can't, I can never remember yeah. where you are. I'm in the Western side of Maine, kind of near New Hampshire. Okay. Where are you in New Hampshire? I'm in Southern New Hampshire. So I'm very close to the Massachusetts border. I just pulled a stick out of my shoe. I need, I need you to know this. That <laughs> I don't know how I got there, but I just pulled it out of my shoe. <laughs> and, and this, my friends is New England living. This is what you're going to get with me. <laughs> yeah. Well, the stick out of my shoe. Moose followed me home. As I do the research for all this, right, I, I stalk people blatantly and I go through Facebook feeds really fast to get a feel for things. You have a love for muscle cars. Is that right? I do. I do. Um, when I was a kid, my dad brought me to um, car shows. We go to car shows because he loved cars and he was a mechanic in a past life. So um, I fell in love with 70s muscle cars and I just I've always loved them. They're super fun looking, but I don't really have a mechanic and I don't really have the time, the money to be upkeeping a classic car. So I bought myself a new Challenger. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, that was the only way I could get my muscle car is the Challenger has the muscle car body of the seventies or closest that you can get these days. So. Like what is it? 13, 17 gallons a mile. Well, yeah. And you know, it works well in the winter. It's real wheel drive. It's awesome. <laughs> You know, that's the best part about driving in winter is the real world drive. I love that stuff because oh, suddenly yeah. I'm in rally school and I'm just yeah. freewheeling it around the corners. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> Was your dad a pretty artistic guy too? Where did you get all of your uh, your creativity? My dad is, was a photographer, a hobby photographer okay. for years and years and years. So he's he, you know, had shot a couple weddings for people, but mostly did it for hobby. So I grew up with having my picture taken like nonstop and I hated it. There's a million pictures of me sticking my tongue out at the camera. Don't take my picture. But we grew up with a ton of photos, photo albums. Um, so that's definitely where I got my love for, for cameras and, and shooting. And I borrowed my dad's 35 millimeter when I was uh, 15 and never gave it back. You know, I had like I think I had a 110 camera. I had the little disc Kodak disc cameras. I had, I had, I had all of those. I, I started on film, learned how to shoot manually, learned how to shoot on film. So I'm that old. Yes. Um, <laughs> you know, it, before film was like the cool retro thing to do. I actually just shot on it because digital wasn't a thing yet. So that's where I got my love for photography, the creativity. I, I don't know where it came from. I, I'm one of five kids, so it's not like yeah. I'm an only child and needed an outlet. No, I crazy household. So so I don't know. I, I didn't draw, I didn't paint, I didn't really build things as a kid. I would <laughs> I would sit in the backyard on the swing set by myself and just sing and make up songs. And that's what I did. So you'd think I'd be a singer, but um, so not. This is a total generalization. Let's just call it what it is. I picture you in like black gothic wear as a <laughs> seven-year-old, you know, <laughs> Adam's family style, just sitting there thinking about how you want to take creepy dark pictures and 
that's where it all sprung. That's really not the case. It's just the story that's going on in my head, right? Yeah, no, I grew up in the 80s, so it wasn't black clothes. You had like awesome flower patterns and everything was corduroy. And <laughs> so, everything yeah. was corduroy. I, of course, had husky size, <laughs> but everything was corduroy. Shwee, shwee, shwee. Yeah, okay, all right. So we've got, essentially, I think we might have been in the same family at some point. I had my dad's camera. He had an old Olympus that I still have. And the, the great thing mm -hmm. about those old film cameras was the straps, like these hippie bedazzled yes. straps, right, that you just don't see anymore. Everything is, you know, seatbelt nylon and whatnot. These yes. things were like macrame or yes. woven with like one hitters in them. Like it was all yeah. sorts of weird <laughs> stuff. I and have one. I have a strap like that. That's what I put on my Rolly Flex. Do you still shoot yeah. with any of those the film cameras? Do you play with them at all? I play with the Rolly, yeah. The Rolly Flex still works well. Uh, my 35 millimeter works, so I have shot with it in the last couple of years, but not too much. Yeah. So you've been doing this a really long time. When did you go? When did you go pro? <laughs> I don't know. What does it, what does it mean to be pro? <laughs> I, don't know. I don't think I'm there yet. <laughs> when did someone say, "Ooh, I'll buy that," and you were like, "Oh my god, you're going to give me money"? When yeah. like did you start to? Take it more seriously and think, wow, this is something I can do for a living. 2011. Wow. Gear costs a lot of money. I wanted to recoup some of it, I guess. Isn't that what we all do? No, I started shooting um, portraits first. Um, okay. So my very first session was an engagement session for a coworker. And I found that my coworkers were the ones who would pay me <laughs> so, uh, for my day job. So uh, yeah, so I just, I, I liked it. I liked having that kind of freedom of expression, but I shot very light and airy, very bright colors, which I still do bright colors, but everything was like blown highlights and very happy and, you know, let's, you know, do weddings and portraits and family sessions. And I lived by the beach. So everyone wanted their pictures at the beach. And I did that for a few years and it was fun. But as I started taking creative photography courses, because I started taking uh, courses in an art center and it was all around creative photography and just kind of expanding your thinking and how to shoot more creatively. I started realizing that I wasn't very creative in what I was doing. No, I could have been. There's plenty of people that are. And every time I wanted to try something a little creative, you know, my clients who were a lot of repeat clients were like, yeah, we just want to do this. Because that's, they, they knew what I could do. They liked what I was doing for them and they just wanted it. And that is completely fair. But I got burnt out at it, you know, after a while. And I do work a day job. So, you know, when you're shooting weddings and portraits on the weekends and doing your day job, you're essentially sometimes you're working seven days a week for months on end. And, and I burned myself out. So I did that until 2018. And in 2018, I moved to New Hampshire from Massachusetts. And when I moved, I decided, okay, no more clients. <laughs> I'm all done. <laughs> um, and I, I just, kind of quit cold turkey um, and gave up all of it and decided I just wanted to do self-portraits and I wanted to explore my world the way I actually see things because the way I was shooting was the way the client sees things. Um, so if they wanted their beautiful family portraits at the beach, I did their beautiful family portraits at the beach. Um, did I like shooting at the beach? No. But that's what they wanted, and that's what they paid me for, and and it was fine. And I loved my clients. I loved loved them. I had clients that came to me four or five years in a row, and and it was super fun to see their families grow. But I didn't really have a passion for it. And so when I moved, I thought, well, this is actually good. I'll make the the break because I am moving over an hour away, so I can't really shoot for these people as easily. And I decided to just explore self-portraiture more, which I had been doing a little bit, you know, and, and delving into, but I decided to go kind of all in. <laughs> I dig it, man. And I, I think the title of this episode just became quitting clients cold turkey, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> with no withdrawals whatsoever. Um, <laughs> well, there were withdrawals because I gave up all that money. <laughs> oh, yeah, there's that. There's <laughs> you that. didn't give up income, but no, it was, it, yeah. I, I always explain it that way, that I just, I quit cold turkey. I just was like, I'm done. <laughs> I know for me, I hit burnout time after time after time. Mm -hmm. I hit it. I hit that wall. 
have to ease back. It's usually after, you know, some period of time, five, seven years. And then I'm trying to counter that with more work and more work. And I just burn myself out and becomes, you know, all right, need to do something completely different. Where did you get to in that point? Did you recognize it early enough that you were burning out from both the day job and working with clients? And have you been able to find a balance with that? Or do you feel renewed now that you're doing your thing and stepped back from the, the retail photography, let's call it? It's really interesting. The way I found I wanted to step away was I didn't like the work I was shooting. And what I mean by that was I didn't think I was growing. I thought my work is mediocre, stagnant, and I started feeling like my clients aren't going to keep liking this. It's, it's not, it just wasn't up to a scale I wanted it to be at. Um, And I started noticing that I felt like I was even declining. Um, And whether or not anyone else would have seen that, I don't know, but I could see it in my own work. Um, And that's when I really thought, I really shouldn't be doing this anymore because if I can't give my clients that top notch and I'm growing and I'm getting better, I don't want to be working with people. Like that's just, I come from a customer service background. I want to give you like the best service. And part of that service is the product. Um, And I just felt like my product was falling off and I traced it back to, okay, why is my product falling off? Like I'm not getting worse as a photographer. (laughs) Um, I'm sure that could happen, but um, you know, I wasn't unlearning things. I was just not passionate. And I find when I'm not passionate about something, my work starts to suck. (laughs) So, so that was kind of my catalyst. And, you know, I noticed that kept shooting a little bit and then the move happened and I went, perfect. This is perfect timing for me to, to make the, the break. And it's not to say I don't get burned out on the self-portrait side, because with everything I've been through in the last few years, I definitely did feel a burnout. And I'm just now starting to get to the point where I feel like I'm back on track. Other people probably don't see that because I can still put out work. But mentally, it's been extremely tough the past year to put out a piece of work to come up with a concept and put out a piece of work. Why do you think that is? Oh, it's a therapy session now. Okay. So <laughs> no, I'm, teasing. No, I'm, teasing. I'm totally teasing. Um, I'm an, I'm an open book and I, I actually speak very openly about this stuff right before the pandemic into the pandemic. I went through a divorce and then we had the pandemic happen. So I have these two colossal life things happening at the same time, right? But also during that time, and this is what I'm very open about, and I'm open in my work when I write about my work about this. I was diagnosed with insomnia, anxiety, and major depressive disorder. All of those things happening really during the pandemic where you can't go out, you can't do anything, your life has completely changed, you're isolated, and and now living in a house by myself was very isolated. It really all played into my mental state and where maybe I was feeling burnout before, but I wasn't acknowledging it as we don't do. (laughs) And so everything from finding the right medication that doesn't mess you all up to surviving your day job, um, because when you're going through all these things and these diagnoses, you know, everything becomes a challenge. And if you, anyone that doesn't know what I'm talking about, you are blessed. (laughs) And and I'm super envious of you, but there's those of you out there who are going to shake your heads and be like, yep, totally understand that. Honestly, I I think that really came to a head and and last year I I well I don't I don't even know. I don't know what year it is anymore. <laughs> so I think in 2021 um that's when really things came to a head and then after that, you know, I've been I've been ramping myself back up. I've been getting back to what I feel is a normal mental state, you know, my new normal of living the life that I live post post marriage, um, things like that. So, you know, out of the pandemic and me kind of crawling out of my hole and being like, Oh, I can talk to other people now. (laughs) So, so yeah. So I, I just think everything came to it ahead all at the same time. And honestly, the pandemic and a divorce forced me to look at my own mental state. Whereas I had ignored 
my issues for years. It's not like these are new things. It's just I newly finally was like, oh, I should get held. <laughs> oh, I can't do this on my own. Um, and so those two tough things forced me to to get to this point. But they've also you know, the pandemic is a horrible tragedy that happened, right? So many people were affected by this negatively. But for my work, it gave me a whole new avenue to work in with um, drone portraiture because I had so much time on my hands to just sit by myself that I created this whole new style for myself. So it worked. You know, no, first, thank you for all of that, right? I think... It's amazing when someone can come to a place where they're able to talk about a lot of these challenges that more people than you'd think face. Yeah. I was exactly the same way until I got diagnosed with my depressive disorder and ADHD and anxiety just across the board. There are all sorts of stuff. I was living this life of, I don't know why I keep failing. I have this passion. I want to do this. And then it wouldn't work out. And then something big would happen. And I'd go into a basically like a mental blackout. It was just really dark periods, right? And it wasn't until I was able to get the help get the medication, get some people to just kind of point me in the right direction and slap me on the ass and be like, that's the way that you have to go, that things started to really click. And it's interesting mm -hmm. that all of that culminated right around the time of the pandemic for you and then opened up the avenue into what yeah. you're doing now. For me, it happened just a few years prior to that, mm -hmm. where I had gone through the same thing, divorce, move, job loss, like all happening at the same time. And then I was like, oh, what do I do? <laughs> when all of that crashed is when I started taking portraits and doing the stone tree stuff. Mm -hmm. And since then, it's been, you know, you get your sinusoidal wave of happiness, um, but it's yeah. been this upward trajectory. And it, it, it was a big renewal just to have my life back. So was it that you started to express yourself and what you went through through self-portraiture or did you go into drones first? How did you start to kind of develop this voice and the style that you have now that is definitely not beach and bright and airy? <laughs> It's not. So, um, okay. I mentioned I took a, a class. I took a class called ultra creative photography. Actually, it might've even been before that. My, we call it UC in the biz. Um, so I, I was taking, I was taking classes from a certain teacher at an art center and literally the same 10 people would sign up for this class year over year. And it was a creative course. And we just got crazier and crazier with stuff. And like, you tried to outdo each other or we tried to outdo ourselves before that. I think I took an intro to intro to creative photography class with them. And I'll tell you, we had an assignment to pick a word. So you had to pick a word that described yourself. And then you had to do the opposite of that word. Okay. Oh, wow. So how do people always describe me? How were people describing me in my 20s? Okay, she's very pretty. The opposite of that is ugly. So my word was ugly. And I had to build a poem and a triptych around that. Hmm. And that was the first time I did anything really creative that I was proud of. So how would I personify the word ugly? Ugly is now a person and how would I shoot her? That was kind of my stepping stone. So I went dark because I thought it'd be super fun. And that's, I'm a little bit of a dark soul in like, I love really dark humor. Um, I don't watch horror movies. Everyone always is like, you must watch horror movies. I hate horror movies. I don't like anything scary. But um, I, I love things like, uh, dead trees. When <laughs> there's a scraggly dead tree, it just looks really cool to me. Um, whereas a really pretty tree is great. It's pretty, but I'm not going to want to photograph that because I feel like a pretty tree is a dime a dozen, but that cool dead tree has a story to tell. And what's that story? So, so I started out doing that. And then I'm a, I'm a bit of a sarcastic goofy person. And so every time we'd have an assignment, I'd try to do something a little weirder <laughs> than I did before. And I started going for shock value. Um, and that's just how I started out is just shock value. What can I do to make the class go, oh my God, <laughs> why did you do that? And I did some weird, silly, weird things, started learning Photoshop and it just go, just go weirder from there. But I liked it. I really liked the weird. Um, and so when I started doing self-portraits, 
in the very, very beginning, they probably weren't weird. They were probably just me trying to figure out how to do a self-portrait without a timer. So you get the 10 seconds and you get to like dive into your spot. That's how I started. Um, I know there's people out there that still do that. Stop it. Get a timer. <laughs> um, it's so easy. So um, I think I just started out just figuring out my camera, figuring out my posing, figuring out some lighting. As I did the creative stuff and got weirder with the creative stuff, I never really thought of melding the two. I feel like they just maybe sort of melted into one another after a while. For me, I love to write. Um, so I, I didn't just like putting out a, a picture. But I'm not going to put out a picture and tell you exactly what I was feeling when I did it. I'm going to help you draw your own conclusions, but I'm going to maybe tell you the state of mind I was in. Sure. or I'll. I started using color to do that after a while. When that's more recent. But when it came to the drone stuff, I had a drone sitting on the shelf, a very expensive drone, and I wasn't using it. And the pandemic hit. And I was like, well, now I can't travel. I can't do anything with this drone. I should sell it. And so I was dead set. I'm going to throw it up on like Facebook Marketplace or eBay. I'm selling this drone. I need to get some of my money back. And then I, I went... I wonder if I can do self-portraits with it. And it was literally just a thought. And when I get a thought, I have to research it. I have to figure it out. And I didn't even know what my drone was capable of. So I didn't realize it had a timer. So I can set like an intervalometer. I can set it to take a picture every five seconds and just keep shooting. And as soon as I figured that out, I was like, all right, what do we do? <laughs> this is going to be so cool. And I, I took... It's probably my most, I don't want to say f famous is not the word, but my most recognized, <laughs> that's the word, <laughs> my most recognized drone photo was the very first one I did. And it's a nude because they almost all are, but um, I'm, I'm curled up in the fetal position and I'm basically in the circle and it's all red, uh, all orange around me. No. Um, Yes, nestled. And that's that's actually been in a bunch of shows. It's been the cover of a couple of shows, which is pretty cool. I'm so not glamorous, guys. I'm lying in my fire pit. So I'm in just lying on damp soot. So everything I do is so not, not pretty. That was the first one I took. And I, I fell in love with the idea of doing this, of having a single subject um, very small and a pullback, but still being able to emote and tell story. And I immediately just went on this path of, of creating them. Um, and a lot of them for me are super emotional. So that very first photo I took was at a very dark time. <laughs> it was a very, very dark. And it's, it's a very light, you know, very pretty picture that a lot of people um, enjoy and it is to be enjoyed. But for me, when I took it, I felt like I was being swallowed up by the earth. I felt like I was alone and everything that you see around me in that photo, all the foliage and the trees and everything that are there, I felt like they were just going to consume me. So I I try when I take one of these photos to not just, um, I know different people have different feelings on this. I'm literally not just like, I'm going to be nude so that people look at it. It's the raw vulnerability of being nude is why I shoot nude. So <laughs> yeah, you know, I've, I've never looked at your work and been like, yeah, nudie photos. Instead, the first thing that comes to mind when I look at your work is, oh, this is a drone shot. This is like a big fine art piece. Right, right. You know what I mean? Like, it's not the first thing that pops yeah. into my head. Um, but I want to step back just a little bit. So yep. As you were thinking about getting into the self-portraiture, right, you were talking about story and and basically you want to give people a, a script outline rather than the full novel of exactly mm -hmm. how to interpret a piece, right? You like leaving that interpretation open. Yeah. Right. So yeah. with with the darker stuff, as I look through some of the work from it's got to be your earlier stuff because it was. 2013 and I was looking at your Flickr yeah. account. It reminded me a lot of Francesca Woodman, poor soul, 22 years old. She did like really dark stuff, yeah. wound up taking her own life at a young age, but she produced this really voluminous amount of work with these really deep, meaningful self-portraits. Mm -hmm. And I don't ever look at your work and think horror photography. 
I don't think, you know, H.R. Geiger, like aliens and stuff. I don't think that direction. I think these really intense, emotive images, a lot of it has a certain blur or mix or darker colors or parts of you are covered up. And is that all conscious choice or was it just like, hey, this is kind of the shot that worked for me? I know in some instances there must be a lot of preparation and and exact posing for storytelling. But when it comes to drones and you're laying naked in the snow and you got a flying lawnmower over your head, I got to think that you're moving through things pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I will, I will correct you a little bit. I, I don't have a lot of pre-planning for, <laughs> for stuff. If my face is covered, if a piece of me is covered, that is, that is planned. That is thought out. I, I did a lot of stuff, even my work outside of my drone work. There's a lot of stuff with my face covered, my mask covered, either my hair covering my face. It's very purposeful because, you know, it's a lot easier for you to see yourself in a photo if you don't have the person's face there. I know not everybody is drawn to the darker side of the art like I do. I know it's I know all art is super subjective, right? So for me, if I can get one person to look at a photo that maybe they wouldn't like necessarily, but because I'm obscured, they either see themselves or they see someone else in it that they know that that is all I'm kind of aiming for, right? Or maybe they don't like the photo as much, but what I wrote up was really raw and I'll, I'll write about my mental well-being. I'll write about my mental health or my struggles and stuff. That's the stuff that's, that's planned, right? That, you know, not how, really how I'm posing because you're right. If I'm shooting, especially if I'm shooting outside and it's cold, <laughs> I'm doing a bunch of poses and then I'm literally running back inside oh, as fast as I can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but what I write up, the colors that I choose, how I'm I'm covering myself or not or the pose, that stuff all plays into what emotion do I want to try to convey? And someone may have awesome happy emotions to a photo. I have a really beautiful, colorful, bright photo that people love. And it was one of my like mentally darkest, like awful moments. And I was trying to capture it, but we're all going to see what we want to see. And I, I love that about art. I think that's really beautiful. I don't need someone to, to dive into my craziness, um, but I do try to pick, and I, I read a lot about color when I'm, when I'm struggling with what emotion am I trying to get out of this? I will look in at color theory and go, what's the best color for this? And then I'll see, does it look good if I edit it that way or not? Um, and I, it's really interesting. I think it's interesting. I don't know what color. Um, I can't see my final photo. You don't have it. You don't have it here first. No. Okay. Not at all. <laughs> I am. I'm the type of person, and uh, about 99 percent of my drone work has been shot in my own backyard. Yeah. In exactly the same backyard in all of the shots. And I just make it look different with color, time of day, shadows. But because I'm shooting in the same place, I have to be very creative about that. Or y'all get like really bored and tell me to fix my lawn because it's horrible. So I, I really try now to use pose and color to tell my story or to build my character. And for me, the way I'm I'm looking at the way I'm prepping for that is I'm not even kidding you. I'll look outside and I'll see the shadows on the ground in the snow and I'll go, Oh my God, I have to get out there and shoot. Yeah. You know? So sometimes it's just that sometimes I'm just like, let me go shoot and I'll build everything else later. <laughs> Other times um, it's a very methodical of I'm going through this thing or I went through this thing. How do I want to portray that? And for me, it's more about, I just need to get it out. I got to get it out of my head. I see myself on the ground doing whatever in my head. Let me, let me get rid of it. <laughs> Your neighbors must oh. think you're a nut job. Um, I warned. So during the pandemic, um, I met my neighbors that can see right into my backyard and they're a retired couple and they're super sweet. And I'd go over there a couple times because who do you have to talk to during the pandemic but your neighbors? And I definitely told them, hey, listen, I'm a photographer. I shoot creatively. I shoot in my backyard. So if you ever 
don't want to see things. Don't. So now I just make sure they're not having like a barbecue back there. Um, and if they're not, then I just go. You don't so. see a whole bunch of eyeballs through the fence or anything. <laughs> Oh my God. Um, I, I did. Someone was like sweeping snow off the back deck. One of the first times I was out there, but I at least had clothes on. So that was right. not too bad, but I've had people come. I, I've shot other people nude in my backyard and I told them like, I don't have a fence, it, you know? And they're like, yeah, that's fine. If you can do it. And I'm like, okay. Well, it's a, it's a super impactful look. And I love how you can take the majority of your drone photos and look at them as a huge series, right? Because yeah. you've got snow on the ground and a red bow, or you've got the, you know, the nestle, yeah. or you've got a very a, a similar layout to what you were doing in nestle, but now the color theory is all different. The pose is different and it changes the feel 150%. Yeah. And so yeah. it, it's really, really interesting. I didn't think when I first started seeing the work that, I was like, oh, that's innovative. That's kind of cool. Like, I haven't seen anybody doing that before. And then another one came out, and I was like, oh, she did it again. And then as more came out, I was like, oh, wait a minute. These, it wasn't just like, oh, this is the only thing I can do. There was purpose. There was story. There was emotion. And I didn't realize that I would get that from a drone that's, you know, 100 feet mm -hmm. in the air. It's just, it's a really, really cool voice that you have in doing all of this. The one thing that I saw, and I remember seeing this on Facebook as well, is when I was w first watching Rings of Power, and there was a <laughs> shot of, um, was a, what it turns out to be Gandalf, spoiler alert, in this <laughs> kind of like circular fire ring on the ground. And they did the drone shot. I was like, they're ripping off Sarah right there. Yeah. And I remember <laughs> seeing you on Facebook within 30 seconds or so going, <laughs> let the record show. I did this <laughs> shot first. I laughed my ass off because it is such a great use of the technology that we have now. So it's a really, yeah. really amazing look that you have from a technical standpoint. I don't want to believe, but I have to believe that something awful has gone wrong while you're doing this. I, I may have gotten mild frostbite on my ass once. That, that <laughs> qualifies. That absolutely <laughs> qualifies. <laughs> um, no, like, I mean, drone-wise, no. My my drone, and um, I've worked with two different drones to do these. Um, no, drone-wise, it's been fine. I will say, because people have asked me, like, why don't you use models? Or why don't you have other people do stuff? And a lot of the stuff I would do, I wouldn't have, maybe not a lot, but some of the stuff I would do, I wouldn't ask anyone to ever do. Yeah. Because it's either kind of dangerous or painful. So you mentioned, I have a blue shot that I also shot in the same spot that I did nestled in, in my fire pit. But I, I built a nest out of sticks. So a human sized bird's nest out of sticks. And to get on that nude was the single most painful to thing. And I've shot on sticks four times. <laughs> Four times, guys. I don't learn. To, to lay on that, I, I literally have scars from it because I cut myself and there's things jabbing yeah. you. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. So uh, there's things that I do, uh, you know, like I put myself in a homemade coffin. I'm not comfortable asking people to do that. <laughs> Like, hey, you want to come to my house? I'm going to make it look like you're dead and you have to be naked. I have to tell you, the the coffin shot, the coffin is made out of flower beds, <laughs> raised beds that I, I hacked apart. <laughs> yeah, so sometimes I, I, I'd have a concept I would never ask another person to do because I didn't, I didn't feel it was safe. But other times, this comes back to, oh my God, I have this idea, I have to shoot it now. Well, I'm not going to wait to schedule someone. <laughs> I'm going to do it myself as quickly as I can. Now, I work full time. I go out and I'm like, okay, I have 30 minutes for lunch. Let's do this. And I get out there and I do it. I don't even consider you having another job. I only know you as artist, photographer, right? Amazing person. <laughs> the really cool part about it is that you've been able to define this style that other people are now asking for. Right. And there's a certain level of pioneering 
I'm not saying you're the only one out there. I'm not saying that you're, you came up with all of this, but it's right. certainly unique in the world of photography to be doing this, especially mm -hmm. as more and more regulations um, are imposed on the world of drones, doing it yes. safely, right? Yeah, I, yes. I assume you have your part yeah. 107, right? I do. Uh, you do, do, right? So, all right. So you're a professional pilot. <laughs> I've got to believe that people are really attracted to doing something different because these can be massive pieces on a wall. Is that yeah. essentially what they're going for? Are they going for these bigger fine art pieces? Yeah. I mean, I have behind me, that's just a 20 by 20. And I think that's like the smallest I would ever print yeah. one for someone to do because, because it's a smaller subject, right? So even I've done couples before and, but they're, they're tiny, you know, right. there's these little Barbies lying on the ground. Um, but if you get, you know, if you get a, an eight, I, all, all my drone work is square format. I've, I've just, I decided that's what looked the best for it. So I only do square format. Perfect. So if yeah. you were to get an eight by eight or a 10 by 10, it's, it's not very impactful. I have a bunch of 10 by 10s, uh, you know, frame that I did in a, a local show and, and they're great and they're cute. Um, you know, and that was just what the space called for. Uh, but I, I think for, for clients to put something like that on their wall and the amount of work that actually goes into creating one of those pieces, um, they should have them big. And I'm not just saying that because it's, you know, more money. Yay. Um, no, it's, it's a piece that you should be proud of if you did this. And what's really funny uh, is the prep time to do one of these for a client is far longer than the shoot time. The shoot time for yeah. a drone portrait is like five minutes. <laughs> okay. I put you on the ground really quick. I've already told you how to pose. We've already decided what like the theme or the style, what you're going to wear. So by the time you're on the drone and the, on the drone, <laughs> by the time you're on the ground, I don't want to put someone on the ground for any length of time here <laughs> dress in your nicest dress and then go lie on the dirt. <laughs> you know, I don't have a nice lawn. <laughs> Get in the yeah. Exactly. I don't, I don't want to, you know, get someone all, all dirty or there's not everybody likes bugs. I don't like bugs. I've been bit by a lot of ants while I'm doing this. Um, you know, I, I have someone down there as quick as possible and I do the same thing that I do when it's myself. I put it on a timer mm -hmm. and that way I'm giving them the direction or I'm saying, okay, now, now open your eyes, now close right. your eyes, now tilt your head so that I'm getting multiple poses, but I do it so fast that it's probably really anticlimactic for them <laughs> getting getting it done. Not to get super nerdy with technique, but are you looking through the monitor when you're asking them to pose? So you're looking at the composition or are you watching yeah. them knowing what the drone is getting and you're just tweaking them as you're looking at them from the side? Um I'm looking at the I'm looking at my monitor. Yep. And that's because if if you look down at someone, you're getting a completely different angle than that drone's getting. Yep. Um, and that's why this is near impossible, but not impossible to do with the camera. Cause I have faked some and there's some shots I've done for clients cause they love my drone work, but they've come to me in like December and they're like, yeah, I'm not going to go lie in the snow. And I'm like, no, you're not, but we're going to do it indoors. <laughs> we're going to, we're going to make it work with the camera. But I have to be able to see that same thing because all right, if you've never done this, lie on the ground and just look at how your body looks. It's not flattering, right? When you, like when you lie down or sit down, like things spread. Um, and I don't care how small you are, <laughs> things do not look good. So um, the posing is very strategic. What is bent is bent because it looks silly when it's straight, you know? So um, I have to see that same view that the drone sees because one wrong move or your feet are like too straight up. Well, the drones are seeing your toes. I want them to see, I want them to see your foot. So I need you to do. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of coaching that happens prior to, and then by the time you're on the ground, it's very simple, or I can just run over and move your foot and be like touching. Um, well, you know, the, the thing that fascinates me about that. And the reason I ask is as these images get blown up larger and larger and larger, 
right? You're going to get all that detail. If it's eight by eight or 10 by 10, you're just kind of like, oh, that's a great looking photo. And you get all the, you know, you don't get as much detail. Um, But when it's big and someone's proud of their, their pose in it, you want it to be absolutely perfect. The, the experience that you have doing the self portraits must really come into play, knowing exactly how all those poses uh, work, which is why I'm such a huge advocate of self portraits in whatever discipline. Doesn't matter drones or anything. If yeah. you can't do it, how do you direct your clients to do it? Right? I, I I honestly have so so much respect for people that are good at telling their clients, like directing their clients, but don't do self portraiture. Because I felt like the only way my brain could get it was if I did it myself. You know, doing the drone stuff, like you said, it's very, it's very distinct and you have to pose a certain way, but I will even, you know, have to say, you know, loosen, open your mouth a little. I, I you have to give that because we're capturing that top down story. It's not like, I, I feel like when people are sitting up or they're standing, they know what to do with their face, <laughs> but you're like, lie on the ground and don't move. Um, you know, it's all of a sudden you're like, what am I doing? Should I open? So I'll, I run them through first one eyes open. Then I'm going to tell you eyes closed. Then we're going to move your chin a little. And, and I kind of run it through ahead of time. And then I go, you're not going to remember any of this. So when we get out there, you know, when we get outside, I'll walk through, you know, while we're shooting, I'm going to walk you through it again. Um, and it's, it's been great, the people that have done it, but I, I will tell you, having done it myself, I also know where, um, your body pitfalls are what's going to make you look larger. Um, I'm not a big person, but I've taken pictures and been like, why do I look like a linebacker? I've had like no neck (laughs) Had to be like, we're going to Photoshop that because I have a neck, (laughs) (laughs) but it's just like when you're lying down and if your shoulders are up and you're kind of tilted, you lose all that. And when you're, when you're shooting someone or yourself and you're standing and you're, you're doing stuff, you know, or you have your computer monitor set up so you can see it. Whereas, you know, on the ground, I do have the drone controller right next to me, but I can't be looking at it because <laughs> then you're going to see the controller and, and not me. So yeah, it's, it's, I used to take a lot of photos doing the drone work because it used to take me like 50 photos to get a couple of poses. And, and now I, I can probably do it in 10. And every drone photo, I will be completely honest, um, is a composite. And I am a stickler about my pinky's too far out in that one. (laughs) I need to take my pinky from the other one. Um, I composite mostly hands in in like every every photo. Um, Sometimes face, sometimes hair. You know, I'm like, oh, my hair was much more spread out in that one. Then I tilted and it's all like, you know, or I wear wigs and the wig didn't cooperate in one, but it did in another. So literally every drone photo I take is is somehow composited. It's magical because looking at what the final product is, it's such a it's such a beautiful piece of art. <laughs> it's clear that you spend a lot of time finessing it. And I don't mean that in a in a negative way, like, oh, this is all Photoshop. It's clear that you care about every detail in that photo. I could talk about drones and nerd out with you all day long, but I want to talk a little bit more about how you've developed the style and what you're doing to stay creative. I know you travel a lot, right? Every time I go online, it seems like, oh, I'm in Death Valley or I'm in Iceland or I'm in Cancun (laughs) or, you know, you were just almost seemingly back to back Death Valley, Iceland. Tell me about those trips, because I've seen what you put online and everybody can kind of look them up. But Death Valley seemed like a creative retreat. Iceland was in a solo adventure. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. So um, Death Valley was a group of friends getting together and just going to shoot. And it was a very random kind of group of people. And, you know, as as creatives know, you're in all these either Facebook groups or Facebook chats or, oh, I was at WPPI once. So now I'm in this WPPI chat. And there's a lot of things like that happening. And I am horrible at social media Um, and not horrible. at it. I've made a choice to not be in every conversation all the time, which you do have fear of missing out a lot. So I'm in a lot of chats that are muted and I don't often read. And I happened to read one and it was um, Dennis Dunbar saying, hey, who wants to go to Death Valley? I think it'd be fun. (laughs) And I was like, 
yeah, put me down for that. We'll see what I can do. And a bunch of people just kind of hopped in and there were like names of people in there that I'm like, Oh my God, I mean, I want to meet this person or I've talked to them. I've talked online to this person for two years. Oh my gosh, I get to meet them. You know, people like uh, Becca Bjork. She's awesome. And I've talked to her for the last couple of years and I've never met her in person. So to have that opportunity is like stuff like that, that, that fueled me. So everybody, or almost everybody was West Coast that went on this trip. I flew in from the East Coast <laughs> um, to meet everybody and to go. And we just got together for a long weekend. We drove around, hit the sites, and shot. And there were um, two beautiful models with us. And me as a self-portrait person, I was like, yeah, I'm going to shoot myself. And, uh, <laughs> you know, we'll see how that goes. Um, and different people shot different things. We shot each other doing stuff. Um, but you have those creatives with you that wanted to push you to do things. It was a long weekend with friends in the desert. You didn't have to do anything. You could have hung out at the hotel you know, none of us cared. We just wanted to get together and be silly and creative. And it was awesome. It, I got to see people I hadn't seen since the pandemic, like before the pandemic. And then I got to meet people that I'd never met before. And that really got my creative juices flowing. And that's why I went. I went not just to hang out with people and get away, but I was like, I need something to jumpstart my brain. It's not, it's not in the right space creatively. Um, and so that was very helpful. And I, I came out with a few pieces and I had no expectations going into that. I was like, I'll just go. <laughs> um, and I came out with a couple of cool pieces and I got to shoot in the sand dunes that were in different Star Wars movies. So if, if you know me, just at, at all, all you no, know, I'm a nerd. Um, oh, I'm a Star Wars nerd. It's not even funny. <laughs> it was neat to watch virtually, right? Because you've got Nicole York, Becca Bjorky, David Franco, right? Olga, oh, was Olga out there as well? Olga Tenyan, Nicholas oh, yeah. Freeman, Dennis Dunbar, right? You've got this all star cast of current contemporary creatives just out on Tatooine somewhere dancing in the dunes, yeah. <laughs> right? And I happen to see like one picture that you had, had posted about our mutual friend, David Franco, who's a phenomenal photographer out of LA, took a picture of you taking a self-portrait of yourself. And it's, yeah. such a, it's such a great shot of you doing what you do, right? Just being mm -hmm. you in this location, being creative, that energy that was out there with these folks must have just been like nothing else. It was awesome. And I'll tell you the, you know, Nicholas had a couple of uh, friends who were models and, and he shoots nudes. So I have these two other women who come out and we go to the site and I, yeah, I shoot nudes in the privacy of my own home with <laughs> nobody around when I'm doing it. And I have these two other amazing, empowering women who are like, okay, and just start stripping. And, you know, I actually um, shot with one of them. It's been really a, a photography goal of mine to shoot self-portraits nude with another creative, another woman. Oh, um, and so I just asked one of them and I was like, will you shoot with me? Um, and I, I, I haven't published any of these. It was more of a personal goal, but I also shoot, shot nude that day. And so I just laugh because I'm like, great, seven of my friends have nudies of me because while I was doing the self-portraits, every once in a while, I'd snap out of my own little trance because when I'm shooting, I'm not paying attention to anything else. But I'd like look up and, and catch like, you know, Brett Stanley taking a photo. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God, <laughs> this is so weird. Just go back into your trance. You won't even you won't even care. Um, and Nicole York just playing um, shutter shutter button and she was directing um, was amazing. You know, so it was it was so empowering to be with these people, um, you know, that I look up to photographically, who I'm looking at and I'm like, oh my gosh, what you produce is so amazing, you know, and, and to have, you know, Dennis there, who's, you know, the reaching God, you know, <laughs> and, and to all be together and you can have those creative conversations, but mostly we just, you know, talked about cloud shadows and 
fun stuff you know, and, and silly things. And that was what was great about it is you didn't have to be too, oh, we're all just going to talk about this or my ways this way or, you know, like us this and canons this. And we we're all different and we just all wanted to get out and not be home and be creative. And it was awesome. Yeah, the fear of missing out on that was so strong. Was yeah. so strong. I'm sitting here in my little cabin in Maine, <laughs> looking around, going, they're in Death Valley having fun. And yep, it's snowing outside. Yep, I'm still yeah. here. But the thing I loved about it wasn't so much that my friends were out there making amazing stuff. The thing that I loved was that there was no competition, that you yeah. were out there purely in the creative space. And this yeah. was the this is the thing that I love when I look back at artists that get together and there's no real competition. They're just like, we're all just trying to make money. Right. You got Andy yeah. Warhol and Basquiat, right. In New York, just kind of like doing drugs and going to clubs and taking pictures and doing all. <laughs> but there's just like this feeling of let's just create for the sake of creation. Let's yeah. get out of the retail mindset or the work mindset or get away from problems or relationships or whatever it is mm -hmm. and just fall into flow. And just being yeah. there, was there ever a moment where you just took a second to step back and look at it all and go, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty lucky to be where I'm at. Oh my gosh, absolutely. You know, when you look at other people's work, whether it's uh, photography or uh, digital art or writing, you know, some people that were on this trip, I'm just sitting there going like, why am I here with you? <laughs> like, how did I get in this group? Like, it just seems, it doesn't seem real to me because, you know, I'm not a full-time creative. I've only known these people for a relatively short amount of time. Um, so I just look at it and I feel like I don't belong. You have that sense of like, I don't really belong here, but but I do, because we're all the same. Yeah, we're all the same. But you do have that very like, oh, my God, I'm so humble to be shooting alongside. Even if we're shooting donkeys, I'm shooting alongside these amazing people. That was my favorite thing that came out of the pandemic was yeah. being in clubhouse rooms every day and getting to know people like I've never met Becca in person, but we've talked for yeah. oh, every day right. for almost a year and a half online yeah. and you know we do the artist forge stuff and all that and it's amazing the relationships that you can form and then when you fall into places where you are together it's like you know each other you've just fallen to creativity yeah. and it's fantastic moving from that you then go from this super creative crowd <laughs> and then you just yeah. kind of like i'm gonna bug on out over to iceland <laughs> And chill out for, you were there for, what, 10 days, two weeks, yeah. something to that effect. And now I've been to Iceland. I was in a workshop with Parker Pfister. We did some of the most amazing work that I've ever done. It's like being on another planet. It's yeah. a, my favorite place on this big old globe is yeah. Iceland, as a lot of people fall in love with it. Yeah. But I watched your adventure going from place to place, and I also read a lot about what you did, saying that you were very purposeful about where you were going, very planful about where you were staying and how you wanted to plan out your trip to make it a mix of both fun, holiday, and creation as well. Yeah. So mm -hmm. tell me about it. I, I've seen some of the pictures and they're bananas, but after being in Iceland a few times prior, or one, at least once prior, right? You've been out there before. Yep. What was different about Twice, this? Yeah. What was different about this trip? <clears throat> so the first time I, I went, I had gone with um, my husband at the time and fell in love with Iceland. It was uh, like you said. I mean, it's another planet. It's so uh, the air is so clean, the water is so clean. <laughs> and then the second time I went, I went with a group of creatives. I went on a creative retreat, which was phenomenal. But both of those times. You have to balance what you go see because you're with people. You're with other people. So, yeah, I may want to go do this thing, but if everybody else doesn't want to go do that thing, we shouldn't go do that thing, right? It's, right. it's, and that's just what traveling with other people is, is like. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. I have no problem with that. So, uh, two years ago, I decided I was going to do Iceland for me and do Iceland my way. And we were kind of coming out of the pandemic and Susan Rockstraw was going to travel with me. 
And, you know, I basically said, there's some things that I want to do and photograph. Um, is that okay? Like I have my own agenda and, and she's such an awesome human being and a sweetheart. And she was one of the people that was in Iceland before. And so she's like, yes, let's go do this. This will be so much fun. But the pandemic kind of had that like second wave type thing. And it started getting iffy. And you've been to Iceland and anyone else who's been to Iceland will understand this. If you haven't been, know that if you're in a more remote area and anything shuts down, there is nothing else. <laughs> so I started to get nervous. What if we're there and there's no place to eat because the one restaurant in town is shut down? Right. You know, so so I got really nervous and I basically said, I'm not comfortable doing it this time. Everything was still under COVID restrictions, and I, I just kind of got a little, little scared. I got that panic. Yeah. So I postponed it. I finally, <laughs> finally rescheduled it, and I decided I'm going to do this by myself. And it was not that I don't love Susan, um, but there were things I wanted to maybe prove to myself um, that I could go do this. And I also, I got a little neurotic and obsessive. <laughs> so I have... <laughs> a 99 line spreadsheet of where I was going to be, how I was getting there, um, how long it takes to travel between places. Uh, I, I mapped out because I was going to solo travel. I mapped out everything um, and gave myself, you know, okay, at this spot, I'm going to shoot this, you know, this photo Right. and this is the gear I need. And then I'm going to go eat at this place and I have 45 minutes for lunch. And then I need to get to the next place because it takes two hours to drive there. And so I'm, oh my God, it's, it's detailed. Um, the reason I went to Iceland this time was not just to get away. My purpose was to come back with a portfolio of images of a project I'm working on yeah. that I've told no one about. No one's really seen anything. Um, but I had a very specific purpose that I wanted to come back with these images. Um, obviously, everything else I got was just icing on the cake, which is awesome, you know, because I was able to shoot some drone shots that were on my bucket list that I never thought I'd be able to do. Um, and I'm super excited about uh, those, you know, one of them's already out and another one's going to be coming soon. I, I went to shoot these images. So I had this project in mind and this like mini portfolio I wanted to come back with. But in between that was, I want to go hiking. I want to see this. I've never seen this yeah. before. So, you know, I built, I built in all of the rest of the stuff around where I wanted to be because I had, I think I had nine shots planned at nine different locations. Very, very specific. I think I shot eight of them because one of them was just not going to happen. There was a, a foot of snow and 25 mile an hour winds. So <laughs> I was, it was not happening. Um, it yeah. happens quick over there, doesn't it? We had done the black sand yeah. beaches in Veek, right? And yep. we're driving back down through, and we were going to what we were colloquially calling the Yoda Cave. I don't know if you ever been to the Yoda yes. Cave. Yeah, no, I, so I know, I know what you're talking about. I think I went to it. I don't think I saw it. <laughs> We, we drive out to this Yoda cave, and for the people listening, um, it is a cave that if you're inside and you look out, the opening looks like Yoda. Point being, we get out there, and we're all in the cave, and we're taking pictures, and it looks really cool. And it wasn't storming when we went into the cave. <laughs> and then we went out to the cave, and we almost got blown yeah. off, the, off the ground because yeah. the weather changed like that, and it was crazy. So... I can imagine yeah. this ninth shot would have been perfectly epic, but it gives you a chance to go back, right? To get it? it? Yes, yes, yes. It would have been epic, though, because it was at that, um, and I cannot pronounce the name, but that gorge, yeah. that big, famous, amazing gorge that everyone photographs. And there was literally a foot of fresh snow that had fallen the night before. And I couldn't even believe I could get to the gorge. I showed up and another car showed up and this couple got out and... Like, all you can see is my eyes. I am covered head to toe. I'm like, literally have this thing up to here and then my hat. And the other couple is laughing because they're like, this is crazy. Like, the weather is nuts. The wind is just howling. There's snow blowing everywhere. Um, so they took, a, they took a selfie 
or they were going to take a selfie. I took their picture um, at the the kind of beginning of the trail that would head up to the platform. And then they took mine and I was like, I'm going to head up. And they're like, what? And I was like, I came all this way. I'm, I'm going out to the platform. And I trudged through knee deep snow and whipping winds just to get up there. And it was hysterical. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, obviously I wasn't doing my shoot up there. My camera would have just blown over. Um, but I was like, I came on this way. I've driven through snowpack for like an hour solid i needed a break so i was like i'm gonna walk up and i'm gonna take some pictures and as i was coming down you couldn't even see my footprints anymore that's how windy it was it just blew it all away so as i was coming back down people other people started to come up and they were just you know laughing and enjoying the craziness but that's the only awful weather i had i did have some wind gusts that i thought i was going to get blown off a cliff it goes sideways really, really quickly. Yeah. But the, yeah. the few images that I've seen come out of Iceland from you from this last trip have been astounding. The, the plane shot and Skogafoss and like just all of these places are, are gorgeous. Yeah. I've got to ask, how was the, was it the Dice K Dasher? Is that the SUV that you drive? Right? Because that's what the, I rented when I got over there. Dasher? Oh, yeah. Yeah, the little, the little Dasher. How does that compare to the Challenger? Um. So in the snow, it's better. <laughs> I'm going to tell you that right now. The Challenger would not have survived Iceland. Uh, you couldn't have driven that where I drove. I honestly, I know people give it a bad rap and they're like, oh, it's this horrible Romanian vehicle and blah, blah, blah. And, and a powerful vehicle. The thing was, I had a manual because I, I, I don't drive automatic. So I had a manual. It's four by four. I had studded tires. The thing shifted so easy. The only issue I had with it. So there's many ways to put it in reverse. I had to figure out how the hell to get it in reverse. And that was the funniest moment. So I drove this car away and I actually, I actually pulled over because I was like, I need to make sure I know where my windshield wipers, my headlights and reverse are. I found the windshield wipers I found the headlights. I couldn't figure out reverse. So I was like, screw it. I'm just going to go. Well, I start driving and I get to my first location and I realized I was in the wrong parking lot and I had pulled in like head first and there was no way I could get out unless I found reverse. <laughs> and so I had to sit there for five minutes, like pushing down on the center thing, right? I was like, where the hell is reverse? And I forgot. It's one of those older ones and you had to like pull up from underneath and then do it. Oh my God. It was the most comical thing because I was like... <gasps> This is embarrassing. I'm gonna have to Google reverse. Like, <laughs> get out, of, get into reverse. I did Google reverse. Yeah. <laughs> I had no idea how to do it. And so first, I show up in Iceland, right? So you land and you have to like you're forced through the duty free shop, right? So I'm yep. like, oh, I might as well get some bourbon. So grab that, and then you go out, and it's very much like the life of the the secret life of Walter Mitty, where you go out yeah. and you're like. Do you have a car for rent? Yes, we've got a red one and a blue one. And it's just like we've either got the, the small white Dasher SUV or the smaller white Dasher SUV. And I'm like, oh, I guess I'll take the white Dasher SUV. And But the same thing, I got in it. And I'm like, all right, I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. I, I don't know how to do this. I can't do this. <laughs> Oh my God, I can't get out of this parking lot. I'm going to waste an entire day's worth of rental just trying to leave the rental lot. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually you get used to it. But yeah, those little bad boys, they can take you anywhere. We've driven, we drove out to the glacier. We drove across oh, yeah. places we probably weren't supposed to drive, but we went yeah. out there anyway. And yeah. Uh, yeah, super capable little vehicles. It was, it was great. And I drove two and a half hours on ice and snowpack and you're from up here you know how that is um you don't usually have to drive on that anymore right it's usually the roads get cleared or they get sanded out of there no, it was it was fresh and it was packed and there were definitely tourists that didn't know how to drive on it and were stomping on their brakes and if you don't drive in snow you I'm going to tell you that's the first thing you don't do. You don't ever do that, <laughs> you know? And so um, I was passing people in this because I was like, well, I'm not driving 20 the whole way and you're going to get me killed because you're breaking. <laughs> so I, you know, I was like, and if you've driven on those roads, the roads are raised up about three feet from the rest of the ground. There is no guardrail. If you go off, you're off. There's no like, light. That's it. 
Yeah, you're done. Oh, there's nothing. And it's one lane each way. <laughs> so, you know, you just got to be like, I'm passing you now <laughs> on ice. And I mean, I'm fish tailing and I'm like, oh, okay, so the wind is you're blowing. New Englander. You're a New Englander. So you're driving with one hand. You got Dunkin' Donuts in the other hand. I know. You're you people think so. Her. Right, but I'm I'm not. I'm over there going. Don't get in the, don't get off the road in a rental. Don't don't get into an accident in a rental. Don't die rocket. <laughs> yeah, that right. is exactly it. But um, but no, I it was Iceland was amazing. Um, I I shot more than I thought I would. I went to a couple locations that were just off the beaten path and. People were like, how did you find out about this? And I'm like, I read blogs for two years. I, when I say I researched, I didn't just look at the sites. It was, oh, I'm going to go to Skogafoss. But if you climb the stairs and start walking along the trail, there's three more waterfalls back there. And barely anyone does that. No one does it. Or, no, I, I know. It was, it was amazing. And it was so beautiful. And so I, I started to do things like that. It's cool. I'm going to go to this site that I've been to before, but then I'm going to do this thing over here because no one does it. Just like at um, Seljanifos, if you walk like five to 10 minutes to the left, there is a waterfall in a cave and you can go in that cave and nobody does that because they don't know about it so i did a lot of those types of things um and then i found a super secret location that google brought me right to like you know they say like don't trust google i trusted google and i turned off on the on the um all gravel roads, not marked, you know, you're going through potholes the size of your car and you're just trying to get through and a kilometer and a half in and I've got icebergs and the glacier right in front of me. So you're not super far away, right in front of you. And there's two other people there. Yeah. So, you know, it was, it was a very methodical, well thought out trip. Um, I also walked over 43 miles on this trip. Um, mostly with 19 pounds of camera gear on my back because you need everything everywhere you go. Uh -huh. um, yeah, so it, it was, that's another reason why I didn't want to ask someone to come with me. Like, hey, come with me. I'm going to put you through this grueling, crazy trip, <laughs> you know, that most people would look at my itinerary and go, that's not possible. And I did every single thing on it. That's amazing. Everything on it. Um, you package yeah. that up, fill it as a course. Hey, buy my yeah. spreadsheet for $399 places to go. <laughs> exactly. Well, so I am coming out. I, so I did one, uh, we'll call it a blog post. I don't really write blog posts, but I did because I want to share all my trip images, you know, just the landscape and everything. But I, there has to be a write-up. I can't just throw an album out there. That's yeah. silly. Um, so I've got, I think, seven of them planned. And it's everything from the sites I went to. I have a lot of pictures. I'd split it up. <laughs> um, the sites I went to, the restaurants I ate in, because I'm a foodie. And I made reservations and ate at all the like best restaurants I could. Um, and, and then what to wear, what to bring. Yeah. So I have a whole bunch of things lined up that I'm going to be putting out there so that people understand if you want to go like in the winter, here's what, here's what I wore and yep. kept me warm. <laughs> like I was not cold, you know, the coldest I got was when I was shooting on the black sand beach and I was shooting nude. So yeah, you get chilly. <laughs> but other than that, other than that, um, you know, I was very well prepared and a very prepared hiker too, you know, with making sure like you can register your trip with the country of Iceland and you can tell them where you're going to be on what days so that if you were to go missing, they have somewhat of an itinerary. Um, so I, I did all of those things to keep myself as a solo traveler very, very safe, even though it's a very safe country. No, it's, it's super safe. But I think that little bit of preparation, regardless of if you're in the States or if you're in Iceland, yeah. is really, really important, especially when you're going out yeah. really long distances. Iceland yeah. is a planet unto itself, and it's really easy to get lost out there. It's really easy to get into a a bad situation very, very yeah. quickly. So as long, if you're, if you have any level of wits about you and preparedness, yeah. 
we're good to go. Um, but yeah. yeah, clothing is big. Food is big. Just understanding yeah. how and where you need to contact people is really big. Um, yeah. but it's a phenomenal place to visit. And if you're ever looking for like a road mate, van mate, you want to do the North side, whatever, call oh, me. Up. That's my next, that's my next trip. We're in. We'll do the North. Cause Done. I've never, I've never gone North. <laughs> yeah. We, we only did the South side of yep. uh, Iceland before we just didn't have time to do the North. Um, right. And I really want to get up there. I know it's a lot more desolate, um, but you and I had the same experience. We got to see the Northern lights. It was. Yes phenomenal i saw your pictures beautiful so everything that i've seen that you've put out has been absolutely insane the gorgeous you can tell that it wasn't just oh it's a cell phone shot out the side of the dasher um it yeah. really was planned out and well thought i can't wait to read these blog posts but i wanted to talk a little bit about the gallery shows that you're in i just saw you and the drone work in like a 3d virtual gallery yeah. showing which is really cool to 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 mm -hmm. see and i don't have the url here but i'll put it in the the show notes it was like a bodies presentation like a, an exploration of bodies is is that yeah i think it was bodies revealed bodies revealed that's what it was Bodies revealed yeah can you tell me about that like i know you do work and you've you've had your work in a bunch of different galleries whether virtual or physical mm -hmm. how do you go about connecting with all of that so i go on call for entry sites <laughs> and see what galleries have open calls for artists and for different shows. And I just, you know, I, I look through them periodically. I try to submit to a few each quarter because um, some of them cost money, others don't. It depends what you're submitting to. But a lot of times it costs you, cost you a little bit, a few bucks, you know, 20 to $30 to submit some images to hopefully be chosen. So I usually look through things, um, you know, what fits well with my work? What do, what do I think? Not just what do I think I can get into, but what do I think I have work that really resonates with the theme? Um, so bodies revealed seems like it, it would be a good one. So I did get two pieces in that one. Um, and it was an all virtual show, which is really, really cool. You know, sometimes I've been in shows that are in South Carolina and I, I can't go see them. You yeah. know, I don't see my work up in print because I can't get down there. So um, it's, it's neat when they're an online or a virtual one because I actually can share it with friends and family. Obviously, if it's, it's local, um, in 2021, I had a solo show in Boston, which was one of my kind of life goals as an artist. Yeah. Um, and so that was really cool to be able to physically go see your work up in print up on walls. So um, it's always fun to see. But I just search. There's a couple of sites that I, I go to and you can see the calls for entry. And you just look through and say, is this something that resonates with me? Do I think I have work that fits this? And I just try to submit every now and then. <laughs> It was really a cool thing to go through because not only do I see your work, but I see all these other artists' work, and then I start That's to go amazing. down the rabbit hole, and you know, it's just yeah, I don't, I don't get that same thing. I love going to gallery shows. I love seeing mm -hmm. and trying to support my friends that have galleries, whether they're big or small, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. um, I've never been in one, so it's always like super exciting to me to see people yeah. in galleries. But the virtual experience was was different because I could immediately start going down the rabbit hole of these other artists and exploring yeah. what they do. And that was just a really cool thing I hadn't seen before. I'm sure it's ubiquitous, but I hadn't seen it before. Mm -hmm. So um, it was really interesting and it just got my wheels turning about what we're doing in our own industry and how we're, mm -hmm. you know, exploring, displaying our own art. You're, you've got the market cornered on the drone stuff. <laughs> it's all yours and i will fight to the death to tell anybody else that it's theirs it's <laughs> it's your market where do you see yourself going with all of this work you sticking with the drone stuff for a while yeah 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 i think i think where i'd like to take all the drone work is to other people yeah right so i want to photograph other people now like i feel like i've 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 mastered photographing myself. <laughs> I want to now create concepts for other people um, and give them those liberating feelings. Uh, you do not have to be nude, <laughs> but, but no, to, to just, 
you know, if someone has um, an interest, I, I photographed Jay Coy and his wife and we built this kind of whole characters for them and this fairy tale. They love love stories. They're so sweet. So, you know, I kind of did this this fairy tale and we had the outfits and, and the coloring and that I knew ahead of time because I really spent a long time thinking about it. So so I want to do more of that type of stuff for people. So whether it's a unique engagement portrait or a unique family portrait, like I want to figure out because now to me, that's the new challenge. Like what can I create this crazy unique piece of art for someone that you aren't going to get anywhere else. And yes, there are photographers who do drone wedding portraits and, and stuff like that. Absolutely. But when I first started this, one of the first things I did is Google the crap out of drone portraits and nobody was doing what I wanted to do. Right. And yes, there's plenty of drone photographers that do stuff, but not in the crazy creative way that I do it. Like I take it a step further um, and it doesn't have to be unrealistic colors. I, I did do an engagement shoot and we shot in a cemetery and we found the perfect spot where I had two headstones and they weren't in the right spots, but Photoshop fixes that. And it was fall. So we had some foliage. So we just like sprinkled leaves everywhere, had this couple lie down and they were goth and I love them. They were all black. And I was like, this is so perfect for me. Um, so, you know, they've laid down pretty much in front of the headstones and they were just lying kind of flat straight up and they each were holding each other's hand. And it was one of my favorite things to do um, just to be able to create that cool scene for someone else. Um, so I'd love to be able to do that. And I love to travel. Um, I'll be in Florida this weekend for a little R and R to actually get some warmth <laughs> after Iceland. So, you know, I want to keep, traveling and as i travel i'd love to be able to photograph people along the way because it's it's just really i don't know it's super fun and it's i like a new challenge so i think photographing other people is what i'm trying to get into a little bit more and um it doesn't always have to be with the drone i definitely have clients who seek me out because of my dark style sure um and they've literally said oh, I love this. Can you do something like this for me? Here's what I'm thinking. And they're looking at my self-portraiture and I think that's really cool. And I'm like, oh yeah, I can do that. <laughs> like, I've done it once. I can do it for you type deal. But there's always something different and unique when it's another person. Like I'm never going to just recreate my photo. I probably physically couldn't <laughs> even if I wanted to um, with all the crazy coloring and stuff I do. So, you know, it's, it's that type of work. I want to take my kind of dark art, fine art look and really apply it to other people because I know there's so many other people out there because they've told me that they love this and it's different and it's very much more like them. We're just our own unique little club where, you know, it's it's just a different style and there's so many of them and I, I just kind of want to bring my style to other people now. I'm like, I've, I've gotten over the, the shock of... of you know, my clients from way back. So now I want to have clients, but do it in the creative way that, that I want to do it and help bring their visions to life. And those are the people I want to work with, the people that have a vision of their shoot and want me to be the one to help them to bring it to life. And that's that's kind of like the dream of all of us, right? Is yeah, have, of course. have clients dig what we do and give us the freedom to do what we want to do and just yeah. be like, no, I'm here. I'm just going to pay you just... You do you, you take the pictures that you want to take and, you know, you just throw the devil horns yeah. up. You're like, all right, let's get loose. Right. I can only imagine what it's, how cool it must be for a couple to yeah. be in one of these shots. Right. It's so, it's so unique. It's such a different look. I love what you do. So where can people find you? Website, socials, where can they find what you're doing? Yeah, so um, sarahjphotography.com is my website. And then on uh, Instagram, it's the Sarah J Photography. It's very important because there's an Australian wedding photographer who is amazing, and she is Sarah J Photography. And so I am the Sarah J Photography so that I don't get mixed up because I kept getting 
tagged in a bunch of stuff that was meant for her. And she's she's an amazing photographer in her own right. I'm just a lot different than what I do. So. <laughs> I quit the wedding's cold turkey back in 14. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so, so much for being here. This has been all, I could keep talking for hours, but I realize we're at 90 minutes and we should probably yeah. reel this in a little bit. Absolutely amazing. I was really happy that we had a chance to get to uh, to talk and learn more about what you're doing. And if you find yourself in Maine out this way, you know, Acadia is not too far. I've never been to Acadia. So, right. yeah, I, so I need to find myself. To Iceland, we're road tripping to Acadia. We got this. Yes. Um, yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> I can't wait. I can't wait until we get a chance to do something like that. But thanks so much for being here. I'll catch up with you sometime soon, okay? Awesome. Well, thank you for having me. You got it. Take care. Bye.